Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. You may remember a couple of weeks ago I shared on, on moving on, and um, a whole, you know, it was a message, I guess, of God allowing things in our lives to prompt us to guide us, to nudge us, to move on to the promises of God. When I think about the widow, I mean, I know that the context of that, that, um, that message was around Elijah. But when you think about the widow, she had run out of food. She had run out of resources. And she had been praying to God. But to answer her prayer, God had to make a whole lot of other things happen and had to rely on the obedience of Elijah at certain times and certain seasons to be able to position himself with the widow at that specific time to be able to answer her prayer and to bless her. I think I've shared this thought with a few people here already this morning. But this morning, I want to talk about behind the clock face. Behind the clock face. And I love that picture, don't you? It's pretty cool. I love the way it, I just love it. Let me tell you a quick story. Um, I always wanted to get into financial services. And when I met Barbara, I had ventured into financial services as I thought was financial services. It was really just telemarketing, and, and I failed dismally. And I had to go back into retail, and, which I hated. Uh, and I'd been in retail management for many, many years, and I, I absolutely hate I loved the people. I loved the customer service. I loved the, th- the thrill of achieving targets, but I, I hated the working hours, Christmas, public holidays, all those kinds of things. I prayed to the Lord, Lord, give me another job. Please give me another job. And the Lord dried up my brook at Glomail. That was the company that retail um, chain that I was working for. The Lord dried up the brook. He, he made it so difficult for me to actually stay that I had to find another job. And so I went and I, I saw this big one-page ad in the newspaper. I think it was actually Barbara that brought it to me and said, here's a job in a bank for you, Justin. And I said, oh, it's selling, it's like personal, you know, personal loans, and oh, no, no, that's not the kind of banking I want to do. That's not what I want to do. I want to do that kind of banking. I don't want to do that kind of banking. So anyway, a whole series of events, and um, I went to my interview. And in the interim, Barbara and I had got saved at this little church in the the middle of um, the city, uh, run down, you know, with old school hall, plastic chairs, sort of faded, torn curtains on the stage, that kind of thing. And um, anyway, so I went for my interview in Barbara's car because my car had been repossessed three months before that. Um, yeah, right. It's the consequences of sin catch up with you eventually, amen? <laughs> Um, and anyway, so I went to this interview in Barbara's little Daiatsu charade that was literally held together with wire and the prayers of angels, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, anyway, I got to the interview, and I was quite nervous. And, and, I, and I remember the guy sat down in front of me, and he said, okay, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, and, and I sort of prayed on the way there, and I said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be open and honest with this guy right up front. I'm just going to just lay it all on the table. And so I got there and I said, okay, look, I'm an alcoholic, uh, former drug abuser. Um, I don't work on Sundays. I'm a Christian. Um, So I won't be, and I won't be attending any of your functions. And then um, I've got two judgments against me through the courts for for finance. Uh, One of them's from this bank. (laughs) You actually repossessed my car three months ago. Um, and, I've got it, and I've got 11 non-payment of accounts, black marks against me. The guy said, whew. <laughs> That's a big one. I said, 
That's who I am. That's where I am. I said, I've got a lot of experience. I can, I can do a lot of different things. And uh, anyway, so we started talking. And, and he said, so you, you're a Christian? And I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. He said, oh, wow. That's, that's cool. And, and, and where did you say you went to church again? I said, oh, we went, I, I, Barbara and I go to Resentable Christian Fellowship. He said, oh, I know a guy that goes there. I said, who? His name is John Lachrancy. He, he was my boss here last year, and he retired. I said, the elder in our church was your boss last year. He said, yeah, I'm sure I can get a good character reference from, from him for you. So, okay. So I got in the car, and, and in those days, you could drive and talk on your mobile at the same time. And I phoned Barbara, and I said, listen, if I get this job, I know it's an absolute miracle. I know it's an absolute miracle. We went to work the next day, and I was, I was, I was there, and I'd, I was the fi- finalist in um, this long, protracted interview process to become the fundraising man- manager for a very large charity um, in South Africa. It was a high-media profile role, which really appealed to my, my inner Justin at the time, you know, to be on TV and radio and, and all those kinds of things. And then I had the banking job, selling personal loans. So I got in the car and I phoned Barbara and I said, listen, if I get this job, it is an absolute miracle. Honestly, it is an absolute miracle. And the next day I was at work and I get a phone call. The lady said, please, can I send through a fax? I sent through a fax. And she sent me through a fax and it was a job offer from the bank at three times the salary I was earning in retail. I was like gobsmacked. And about two minutes later, the phone rings, and it was Kotlin's, this, this charity. And she said, Justin, congratulations, you have made it through to the last. And I said, I can't take the job. She said, why? I said, God has given me another job. And she said, but you've, passed, you've come through also this, you, you know, all these steps, and you, you're the finalist. And I said, I can't take it. And she said, God gave you a job, and just slammed the phone down on me. And, it, and so began a, a fantastic career at the bank. I went from sales consultant to assistant general manager in seven years. Absolutely a God thing. And there are many, many testimonies I can share of how God worked behind the clock face to be able to get me to a point where I needed to be. The first clocks, as we know them, as that mechanical clock over there, was invented in the 13th century. And it's an analog clock. It's got hour, hand, minutes, and um, seconds. And if you actually open up a clock, and I'm not talking about an electronic clock, when you actually open up a, a, a mechanical clock or a mechanical watch, the intricate detail of those components is amazing. They are so small, so fine, so well engineered. There's cogs, there's springs, there's... There's little levers, all kinds of things inside, winders. But when you actually look at the face of a clock, you don't see all of that stuff going on. You only see the hands. You only see the hands on the clock face. And that's a little bit like our prayer life, you know, as Christians. When we pray a prayer, we are waiting for that second hand to speed around the clock and to answer God to answer our prayer almost immediately. But for, for me, and I'm sure for a few of you, it's like staring at the hour hand. It takes a long time sometimes for God to move suddenly. It takes a long time sometimes for God to move suddenly. God is working behind, the, and I'm here standing in front of you today, that God is working behind the scenes in each and every one of your lives to bring about an answer to your prayer. Just because you're not seeing the hour hand move fast enough does not mean that God is not working behind the scenes to make it work for you. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14, verse 12 to 16. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they had killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? Isn't it amazing that Jesus had prepared the Passover so they may eat? 
not the other way around. And he sent, two of, sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I might eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out, and they came into the city and found... It just as he had said it to them. And they prepared the Passover. Now I'm going to be a little bit dramatic here. And so for the theologian and biblical scholars in the room, I apologize in advance. This is not in the Bible. It is not in the Bible and I'm not quoting scripture. I am adding a little bit of dramatic license as to the conversations that would have happened with the two individuals we're talking about this morning. This is the story of Yossi Cohen. Yossi, says the Lord. Yes, Lord. Today, some men are going to come looking for Ilan Leibovitz's inn to share the Passover. It's a busy day today in the market. And I need you to do something really different so that the men will recognize you and be directed you, by you to go to Ilan's house. Yes, Lord. I want you to stand on the corner in the market with a pitcher of water. What? I want you to stand in the corner in the market with a pitcher of water. Don't you know that that's a woman's job, Lord? That is not a man's job. That is a woman's job. In our culture, in our ancient culture, that is a woman's job. Yes, says the Lord. I want you to carry a pitcher of water. And, and then Elan says, whoa, hang on. And you know what kind of women stand on the corner as well? Yes, I understand what kind of women stand on the corner too. But this is what I want you to do. Lord, show me another way. Please show me another way. And the Lord replied to Yossi, Lord, it says, the Lord said to Yossi, no, Yossi, this is my way. Think about it. In that context, a, a man actually going into the market and having to carry a pitcher of water. What a countercultural statement that would have been. How hard it would have been to be obedient just to that. The second story is of Ilan Leibovitz. Ilan. Yes, Lord. Today I want you to prepare for the Passover in your upper room. Have the best lamb, bitter herbs and unleavened bread and set out for the guests. Make sure you use the best wine too. Yes, Lord, but how will I know who they are? When the time comes, you'll know. Now go and prepare the room. And so he was obedient. Now think about it this way. There are several things that the men had to do to fulfill the plan and purpose of the Lord. Even though they couldn't see the big picture. First, they had to have been in a close relationship with God, right? They would have to have been in a close relationship with God because otherwise how would they have not known who they were talking to? How would they, who have they been obedient to if it wasn't for God? And how would they be obedient to somebody that they didn't know? The second thing is that they were obedient. They were obedient to God. They were willing to take the risks and counted the cost of their obedience. They had to make the choice and God chose them to make the right choice. And, and the fourth point there is that they trusted God. You see, these two men were having conversations behind the scenes to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God. God is working behind the scenes in your life to be able to make a way for you. He is there answering your prayers in ways you cannot even conceive. Have you, I wonder if there's any of you that have sort of been praying for people. I, I remember a, a, once I was driving to work 
And I was so compelled to pray for the managing director of the bank. And not only that, I was so compelled to let him know that I was praying for him. I didn't know, he was a, I didn't know who he was or what he was or, or anything. I just felt compelled to pray. And so I prayed. It must have been an hour for him and his family. And I got back. I got to work, and I was shaking at the keyboard when I typed out the email to the managing director of the bank and said, Pete, I just want to let you know that I've been praying for you for the safety of your family this morning. Please forgive me for being forward. And I almost want to say, don't fire me or anything like that. But anyway, sent it off. About five minutes later, I got an email back from him, not his PA, not in one of his executives, from him, exact, from him saying, thank you, Justin, really appreciate the prayers. I've checked in with Karen and the kids. Everything is all good. I thought to myself afterwards, wow, well, that's a little bit boring. And then, I th- and then I thought about it. I thought, God has actually answered your prayer, so what are you complaining about? <laughs> God has answered your prayers. That's why nothing's happened. That's why everything's all good. I thought that's a great thing to remember. That's a great thing to remember. God is constantly working in our lives, but sometimes it takes obedience and it takes us having to do things we don't really want to do to be able to, what in, in our own life, to achieve God's plan and purpose. But we may be used by God to fulfill the plan and purpose in other people's lives. So not only do we have to be obedient in our own lives, we have to be obedient in when it comes to others as well. When you pray and believe, Jesus is behind the scenes working it out, often with people who won't be obedient, who are fearful or, or don't even listen. God is going to use people if they won't. Let's, I, I, I'll show you what I mean. If you look at Esther chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai says to Esther, Queen Esther, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Even Mordecai knew that if Queen Esther didn't do this, didn't stand up for for her people, God would raise up somebody else. When God is answering your prayers behind the clock face, if somebody won't be obedient, if somebody won't listen, if somebody won't do what God is asking him to do, God will, do, God will get somebody else. There may be a slight delay factor. There might be a delay factor. Those are the divine delays, and that's, an, that's another message in itself. But God is working behind the scenes to answer your prayers every day. I absolutely know it and I believe it with all my heart. God is using people to fulfill his plan and his purpose. The complexities behind the clock face mean that there's multiple things that need to happen at the same time in sync. God needs to get lots of people to do lots of different things, to be obedient at exactly the right time so he can answer their prayers so that he can answer your prayers. And all we have to do is believe and have faith when we pray that God is going to answer our prayers. But like so many of us, when we pray, the first thing we do is we look at the second hand. When, 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 when. I know we live in an instant world. Instant coffee. Instagram. iPhones. Internet. All these things. Information that... You know, we never had before. I, I, when people, I, I saw a thing on Facebook not so long ago. It was actually a joke about a, a guy that was an Encyclopedia Britannica salesman. I said, I actually remember a guy. I actually remember a guy knocking on the front door trying to sell Encyclopedia Britannica. And God forbid us, us children that ever cut the pictures out for projects for school, right? <laughs> or was I the only one? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've got, got the hand of learning against the seat of understanding for that one, I can assure you. Mark, Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24. So Jesus 
answered and said to them, this is to the disciples, for, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those, he, that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now I have prayed many, many times for the Lord to bless me financially. I, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. And I'm not going to ask for anybody to raise their hands. Sometimes the, the monumental effect of trying to overcome some of those financial barriers can be so great that you need a miracle. And you know what? How many times has God answered our prayers in ways we never anticipated? I, for one, I don't, I've never, ever won the lottery. And that's what I've prayed. Lord, as I'm walking down the road, please let there be a lottery ticket lying in the gutter. <laughs> and then I will bend down and pick it up. And and define the numbers of the, the Powerball, which will be the winnings of my $8 million. And Lord, I will give you half. <laughs> the Lord is working behind the scenes. But he's, he's, not going to give, he's not necessarily going to let you win the lottery. I even went through a bit of a headspace, I won't say when, a few years ago, where I thought, well, I'm not going to pray that way, because then I know the Lord's definitely not going to answer my prayer that way. So I just said, Lord, here's the situation. I surrender it to you. However you want to answer it is up to you. Because don't you know that we actually start to paint the picture. We start to think, well, if, if this is what I'm asking God to do in my life, I better help him nudge in the right direction. I need to help God understand how I want my prayer answered. But God is working behind the clock face in ways we cannot even define or see to answer your prayer in a perhaps ways you can never even imagine. 1 John 5 verse 14 to 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked from him. It's like asking your parents over and over and over again for something when you were a child. You know that they've heard you. Sometimes, most of the time, they had selective hearing. But for the most time, when you're praying to God, our Father, He's actually, He hears you. Even those rote prayers every day. God says, I'd rather hear your voice than nothing at all. And when you're praying to God, He's working behind the clock face to make your prayers come true. Don't expect it to be in the exact way you, that you're thinking. Because God is far greater than you can imagine. He's far greater than you can imagine. And there's a plan and a purpose for all of his children. And you might just be a cog in somebody else's clock. And they might be a, clock, a cog in your clock. We've got to pray that for each one of us, even sitting in this, in this space this morning, that we would be the cogs and the wheels and the springs of each other's answer to prayer. I don't know how that works out, but I tell you what, if we're available and if we're obedient, God will use us. He will use us in small ways. He will use us in big ways to, to be the, the inner workings of somebody else's answer to prayer. One of my favorite scriptures is Matthew 6, verse 33. But so seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things things shall be added to you. If we seek God, if we truly seek God in a, in a way that is yielded, we, we can go to God with our petitions. We can go to God and say, this is my prayer. And I know that I've prayed this many, many times. 
I've prayed this many, many times. I'm not expecting you to answer it the way I think you should, you should answer my prayer. I'm just surrendering the prayer to you. I'm yielding to your plan and purpose. And that's the key, is that yieldedness. It's that yieldedness. God wants to do stuff in your life. We are children by adoption of the Most High King. He loves us. What parent wouldn't want to bless his children? But, but, with every good parent, there comes boundaries. There comes discipline. There comes instruction. And that's what it means to live a sanctified life. We, we don't want to necessarily sin against God or, or be um, against what God's plan and purpose, but we are sinful by nature. Thank God we are covered by the grace of the Lamb. Watching the hour hand is like watching the kettle boil. And there's many, many quotes about that. I won't go into all of that. But it can be a long and faith-testing process. Watching the hour hand, watching the, the clock move, it's a long, long, hard process. But knowing that the Holy Spirit is actually with you whilst, you, while you, whilst you're doing that is a really, really important thing. God, you've got this. You've got this. I surrender it to you. This breakthrough that I've been praying for, you know what? I'm going to take the picture of of exactly what I think that should be, and I'm going to lay that aside. Because you're the Almighty God, I'm actually going to pray that you're going to answer my prayer in a way that I don't understand, but it's going to bring honor and glory to your name. It's going to fulfill your plan and purpose for my life, not what I think the plan and purposes for my life. God's timing is perfect. It doesn't always work in with our schedule, which is hard. It can be a hard thing for us to come to terms with. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Galatians 6, verse 9 and 10. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. 2 Peter 3, verse 8 and 9. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God is working behind the clock face in your lives. He is answering your prayers today. He is answering your prayers today. Surrender what you think the answer to that prayer should be. Very clearly, if you're praying for healing, surrender that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm praying for healing today. I need healing in my body. I know what the symptoms are. I know what the thing is. But ultimately... I just need to know that I'm going to be healed. And the Lord may say to you, I'm working behind the clock face. I might need to get this surgeon to finish up that job so that he can be positioned in his car to receive the phone call from his secretary so that he can be there to be able to be uh, available for your appointment. God is working behind the clock face in every one of our lives all the time. And we're not just one clock in isolation. We're all interconnected. All our clocks are interconnected. And the single spring that holds the whole lot together is the Holy Spirit. Up and down he goes amongst and throughout all these clocks. And time is out of, is out of our control. We see time in a linear thing, beginning and end. God is under, over around time. Time is meaningless to God. 
And time for us is we time for us is a very short thing, but for God could take a long time. And finally, I just wanted to share from Romans eight twenty eight. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is good. God is good. And his purpose for your life is good. You have to, I have to trust the timing of those promises. We have to trust the plan and we have to trust the purpose. And we have to trust that God is working things out behind the scenes in many people's lives to answer our prayers as he is using us to answer the prayers of others. Some folks have been waiting for a long time for prayers to be answered. I know of many grandmothers that have prayed for grandchildren for many, many years, not seeing anything happen in their lives, just destruction, pain, suffering. I know my grandmother was a praying grandmother. I was the prodigal grandson, times 10 or whatever you want to... I was the one that was... I was the wayward grandson. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And one day, as God used all the things behind the clock face, as he used all those things behind the clock face, I came to my day of salvation. And her prayer was answered. Now surely in her mind and in her heart, she would have wanted me to be saved the very day that she prayed that first prayer. But I had to go on a journey. I had to find my own way. I had, to, I had to be the cog and the spring and I had to come across all those challenges and I was, I was the problem. I was the problem. And yet God in His infinite grace, His infinite mercy reached down into the mud, the muck, amongst the pigs and, 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 and all the mess. He reached down and He grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and He let me know that He loves me. What, what, a, what, an awful, what an awesome thing to know that we are loved so much by God that over all those years he would listen to an old lady's prayers for somebody that had no time for him at all. And he would still, in his infinite mercy, in his infinite grace, reach down and drag me out of the mud, out of, uh, out of the mud and out of the mire and set my feet upon a rock. And his name is Jesus. There's so many people here today that have got prayers that they are praying. We're Christians, we pray. And today I want to give you the assurance that God is listening. He hears your prayers. And the word I have from the Lord for you this morning is don't give up. Don't look at the hour hand. Don't look at the clock face and say nothing is happening. Or things are moving too slow. Trust God that he's working behind the clock face to bring your prayers to fulfillment. He loves you and he loves the people that you're praying for. Ultimately, we just got to surrender to his timing. His timing is perfect. His plan is perfect. And his purpose is perfect for your life, for my life. And for, your, and for the others who are the cogs, the springs, and the inner workings of the clock. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you that we have such an honor, such a privilege to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, that we are part and parcel of, of the answer to other people's prayers. Whether it's a kind gesture, whether it's paying for somebody's coffee, whether it's helping somebody that, that's standing in the queue that can't afford to, whose card keeps bouncing at the checkout, and we, we reach out and pay for their, their groceries, whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be obedient so that we may be effective cogs in other people's clocks. 
And Lord, we pray that as we, as we stand fast, as we, as we hold on to the breakthrough and the promises, Lord, as, as we just cling to the hope that is in you, as we trust in answered prayer, Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage and the strength to keep on keeping on. Don't let the enemy come near us, Lord. We live in a fallen world. Things are raging around us. But let us find peace and solitude and stability in you. And let us be so conscious of our part in the, this global clock, this heavenly clock that is the Lord God Almighty. Help us, Lord, to be effective inner workings for your kingdom and maybe be the perfect, precise answer to prayer in other people's lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the honor, all the praise, all the glory. Jesus loves us so much. And I, I wanted to ask this morning, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, are, is there somebody here that needs to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? You've hit that point in your life where you just don't know how you're going to carry on. The helplessness is leading to hopelessness. If you're that person this morning and you want to know Jesus, just put up your hand. If you want to know Jesus this morning as your friend, as your Savior, as the person that is going to answer your prayers, that is going to guide you and lead you, just raise your hand. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for these beautiful people. We thank you, Lord, that you are the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, we just surrender this week to you. We surrender our, our inner workings to you. You are the, the great watchmaker. You are the great waymaker. And Lord, we just give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please feel free to, to go and get a coffee and to hang around and have some uh, time out there and build community. Um, if there's people that want to come up a front um, for prayer, and, I, and I'm thinking about that resilience to keep on keeping on. There are people in here that have been praying for a long time uh, for something to happen, and they haven't seen the fruit of that yet. And maybe you're finding that they're, they're losing a little bit of hope. They're losing a little bit of strength there. Please come up. Let's, let, let's pray for you. God is on your side. He is the one who will strengthen you. He's the one that will give you the courage to endure and ultimately answer your prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.